Well, good evening, good people of music, and welcome to uh, Kerrang's North London HQ. Uh, you join us this evening for In Conversation with the one and only Skin from Skunk and Nancy, of course, one of the most inspirational, confrontational, and indeed successful bands of their generation. Ladies and gentlemen, Skin. <laughs> and indeed, the dog. I remember the days when we used to just play to, like, you know, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that was all the people that were in the audience was a dog. So that is true, yeah. But, uh, of course, it's 25 years of Skunk yes. and Nancy, a real milestone. Yes. And, and what a career it's been. You, you've collaborated with, well, Tony Iommi at one end. I know. Luciano Pavarotti at the other. <laughs> Who was the That's best out um, of those two? Just, it's weird, actually. Tony Iommi had probably the best stories. Natch. Yeah, you know, he had the best stories. Um, Pavarotti, actually, um, I had voice training with him. So it's probably more useful. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and he probably had a better menu as well. Didn't yeah, you, really? no, he, did, he actually cooked for us. Did he? Yeah. Amazing. But I got food poisoning the next day. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about playing to a man and a dog, and, of course, yeah. your very first show was literally down the road here. Yes. At the Splash Club uh, in King's Cross, a stone's mm -hmm. throw away, in fact. Yeah. Uh, I'd wager that no one in the audience tonight was at that show. So, had they been at that show, what would they have actually seen? Um, it was. It was. I remember it was very hot. Excuse me. <coughs> um, very sweaty in a time those that that place had no air conditioning. It was a real trashy, nasty. Can I swear on this? You can. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. It was a fuck hole, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that why far. it was so glorious. Do you see what I did there? Um, <laughs> and it was basically, it was, it was horrible. And that's why all of it, it was like cheap and crappy and sweaty. And it was weird because me and Cass and Ace were like the best members of all the bands in that area. Um, and so we're a bit of an unsigned super group. And so everyone was like, we got to see what this is going to be like. And yeah, our first gig just went off. Uh, every, all of our friends came, it's only 250 people. All of our mates came and it just totally went off. It was like grinding, dirty, ugly, like bluesy groove, skunk and Nancy in the early days. Um, and we loved that. Yeah, 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 kind of. And then the rest is kind of history. And the rest respect. is history, yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that vibe. In those days, there was, we did, we did some demo tapes but they sounded so awful because we really didn't know how to record. We didn't know how to record ourselves. We didn't know, we didn't know how to get our sound, um, to produce our sound for it to sound good. So we just were just arrogant. Yeah, if you want to see the band, you've got to come down to this live because we're <laughs> interested. You know, we, it was just because we were shit recording. Shit recording. <laughs> um, shit recording. Um, but, um, but that worked, you know. The next gig, a bunch of 40 AMR men came down and... Because I think that it was just that attitude and that arrogance was, was, was what was needed. Because I think sometimes when you have, this, you have this begging bowl approach to what you're doing, you know, oh, you know, please sign us, please do this. Then they get a bit arrogant and you, you put all the power in their court. So therefore, we had all the power. We kept all the power by saying, you know, if you want to see us come down, if you don't come down and see us, we're not going to see you, you know. And we knew that once we played live, that was a thing that we did really well. And we were playing to our strengths in that way. We thought, we'll play live, we'll smash it that way. We feel very confident about that. And we didn't have any confidence about anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. just about pushing the things that you, you, you know you do well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, coming back to your own personal story, though, you didn't start out as a rock singer, per se, did you? You started no. out singing different types of music. I mean, uh, yeah. just tell us about those early formative days for you as a singer, because that's really well, interesting. Well, the, the first time I started singing was at university, and I was in, like, university band, you know, and it was, we just did covers. But what was really cool about it was we did, like, covers that no one knew. So, um, like, t old talking heads. Right. Um, and, you know, songs like that, that, you know, people knew them, but we didn't do the obvious ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we yeah. did a song called Blind. Right. And my first gig was horrible because... Um, I walked on stage and forgot every single, like, lyric to all <laughs> of the songs, except for Blind by Talking Heads, you know, it yeah. just goes, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind, 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 blind. So I just did that for four minutes. <laughs> 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 you know, and then next minute I thought, oh, then the, the lyrics started to come back because I used to get a horrible stage fright. 
Um, but yeah, so the early days, um, I actually used to sing jazz because I love jazz, and um, and that was the easiest thing to to start singing. You know, um, which is the a easiest bit of a, thing. a bit of an oxymoron yeah, because yeah. jazz is not easy. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it was that putting yourself in that difficult situation, that challenge, made me really develop my voice. Um, I had I had the real book, and I had to learn all the songs in the real book. Um, but it just wasn't me. It was a bit too nice. I mean, yeah. at the time, for me, jazz was like, you know, the autumn leaves go yeah, through yeah. my window, blah, blah, blah. And then you just, like this for a minute, while everyone does a solo, <laughs> you know. <you're laughs> yeah, that's good, you know. <laughs> and I was like, this is boring. <laughs> but I suppose the weirdest thing, right, and I haven't actually told anyone this, you're the first, is that I used to have these dreams. And when I was dreaming, I saw myself on stage going like, ah! You know, and that's, I just I keep having the same dream. And I guess that was subconsciously what I want to be doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's kind of, though I just keep having the same dream. It was a weird thing. And I, I kind of directed things in that direction because that's, I, I knew that's what I, where I wanted to be. And that's what I wanted to do. But if you're like a little girl, skinny black girl from Brixton, you know, there I had no... Um, all of my idols were like, you know, white guys, you know, playing guitar and skinny white guys playing guitar. S so such as? Oh, you know, like Thin Lizzy and, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. and well. Motorhead and, you know, the big afros. They looked a bit black and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, later on it was Kurt Cobain, it was the Raging yeah. Machine, Smashing Pumpkins, all those bands that came just before us. Um, so I just had this impression in my head and I just kind of, that was my influence, really, yeah. what I saw in my head. Let me ask you, you mentioned, you know, uh, growing up in Brixton and what, and what have you. Your, your grandfather had a club there as well, which is a yeah. very well-known club. I mean, you know, it hosted the likes of Cassius Clay before he became Muhammad Ali and yeah. Bob Marley and people You've like that. You've done your research? <laughs> yeah, it was in Kerrang. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was that interview you did in Kerrang, remember that? Oh, right, yeah, okay, yeah, cool. There you go. It was all in there. Yeah, yeah, you always find it in there. <laughs> but, um, but the thing about it is, I mean, what influence did that have on you as... You know, as, as an individual and also as a musician, because it's a very different background from, as you say, from being, you're, you're not in a white rock environment. Quite no, frankly. absolutely not. I mean, I, before I was, I never heard rock music until I started watching Top of the Pops as a kid. Yeah. Um, and it was all R&B and reggae, ska. So my granddad's nightclub, it was just ska, 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 which I loved. Yeah. And that's what got me into rock music was the, the bridge, probably, that's it, probably in Kerrang, but what <laughs> that's what got me into it was the bridge from white boys like the beat, the specials, madness. Suddenly you had these white boys playing a music that was like, oh, that's familiar. I like that. That's, that feels... And so I got into that and then I got into... I heard The Cure and then yeah. I heard Led Zeppelin and when I heard Led Zeppelin it was all over. Um, but, um, yeah, it was... It was a thing, the thing is that you... I was just in a musical environment, you know? My brother was um, in Sloyd Sound System which is like, you know, in those days, sound system just to plug into the, the, the light, the lamp in the middle of the side of the street. What do you call them? The lamp, you know, lamps. Yeah, just street lights. Street lights, street lights. Yeah, street yeah. lights. Yeah, you just break into it, plug into it, and use that to power the, um, the sound system. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. they would just have a party for a few hours until it got closed down. And this was normal, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. my brother did that, and my uncle played drums, and my other uncle played guitar. And then I was raised in a nightclub, you know, so there was just music, 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 music. Um, the difference was that, you know, I think I was the only one that really took it seriously because when you've got your whole family playing music and no one makes any money, oh, hello, <laughs> <laughs> and um, nobody makes any money and no one kind of takes it seriously, um, I was the first one to really go for it and be ambitious about it and, and do something with it. Yeah. Let's come back. I've got a question from the audience. Is uh, Liz Bentley here? Liz is here. She's waving at the background. She hasn't actually shouted out yes, but she is here. Hello, She's Liz. Here. Hello. Um, uh, she, she, the first band she saw when uh, she was 15 was Skunk and Nancy, and she's very oh. proud of that fact. Good. Uh, yeah, well Good. done. Good for um, you. But she wants to know, uh, uh, who was the first live band you actually saw? That made an impact um, on you? Actually, it was Change <laughs> with Luther Vandross. Uh, right, really? Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nothing to do with rock. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. probably the first concert concert that I saw as a kid. Right, right, right. You know, because right. in my, um, I think in the club that I was raised in, I, they used to have live music there sometimes, but 
you know, I don't remember any of it really. But yeah, that was probably my first concert concert. Right, right, right. Because we couldn't afford to go to gigs, so I got a free ticket from somewhere. Right. Well, blagging even then. Yeah, yeah. Bla- exactly. I was just like, oh, concert, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? I don't know. I'll go. Give me back. I've got a change of heart. Well, yeah. There you go. So you still there remember, you still yeah. remember changes. <laughs> yeah, so it was um, that vibe. And um, yeah, it wasn't until I was older that I started going to gigs that I wanted to go to. I mean, you know, we just had no money. So um, the things that I saw as a child were things that were free or they gave to like young black people in Brixton. Like for instance, my mum used to get tickets to any theater for a pound. Right. Because I guess they wanted more black people to go to theater. And so I saw loads of theater when I was a little kid. And I think that maybe influenced me more than anything, just seeing a stage and seeing people perform. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, when it came to actually forming Skunk and Nancy though, bearing in mind your varied background and all the rest of it, and you'd been in bands by then, what did you, Cass and Ace, kind of set out to do because you did have a bunch of experience as you said Mm. and it was kind of like was there kind of not a game plan as such but you kind of seemed to know what you wanted to do from day one really well yeah that's good that we seem like that (laughs) because we really didn't I mean if you imagine that we were kind of like in this King's Cross bubble and there were all these bands playing we were in competition with all the other bands so we wanted to be we wanted to kick everybody's ass and that's a fundamental thing in Skunk and Nancy, is like we always wanted to be better than those better than those guys, better than those guys. It was competition because we knew that having me as a lead singer was a bit difficult doing the music that we wanted. So the only way we could get there was just being like better than everybody else and being more aggressive and more blah blah than everybody else. But there was no plan right. apart from you want to get signed and you want to tour, you know. Um, and we never really overanalyzed that either. You know, we didn't, we just kind of wanted to make music. In the early days, we just wanted to do this all the time and have that feeling all the time. And there was no kind of world domination or any kind of that stuff going. And, you know, we weren't, we should have been more ambitious, to be honest. But it was just like, this feels really good. And we just, you know, I think it's that sense of like, None of us wanted to have jobs that were boring <laughs> and horrible and daytime and working, you know, nine. We just didn't want to have that life and didn't want to have that job. And the way to just to not do that was to be in a band and that felt good. And then that was really the drive for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. was really kind of like, God, we've got to make this work because if we don't make this work, we are going to have to have the jobs that we don't want to do. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you described your band as being a, a clip rock band at one point, <laughs> I believe. Um, who else was part of that movement? Nobody. <laughs> Do you but know, it was, if, if you can imagine, you know, when Skunk and Nancy started, it was Britpop. Yeah. And we were not the image of Britpop that people want, were selling to America. Because if you can imagine, it was like, you know, you remember, it was yeah, a yeah, I do. huge yeah. marketing fi- thing yeah. where... All these bands, Blur, Oasis, Echo Belly, you know, all yeah. these bands that were all basically the same. Yeah, yeah, Few yeah. women in there, more women than there is now maybe in rock music. But um, but it was that was the image that they wanted to market to America and we just didn't fit, you know. And at first we were like, <gasps> we want to be on those TV shows and we want to be in those radio shows and blah, blah, blah. But it didn't work. It didn't fit uh, in terms of what they were selling, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so... We, after a while, we were like, well, it's kind of like if someone doesn't want you to be part of the party, then you set up your own party. Well, I'm going to do my own party. We're going to do our own thing. We don't want to be in your party anyway. Um, and that kind of worked really well for us because we, then we became, because, you know, it got the whole scene got bloated and whoa, and then lad culture started, ladette culture started, and it was just all, you know, whoa, you know. And um, only there were just the beautiful bands at the top that were really, really good. And then the rest of it was just like a muss of shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And And then it got uh, worse. And (laughs) it just got worse and worse. And then they were just like, and so we became like the antidote to Britpop, really. Um, So what happened with getting back to what you were asking me about? So by that time, we were just like, yeah, we're not Britpop. We're not part of that. And it was much cooler to be not part of it. So somebody said to me one day, so, um, ah, what do you think about Britpop? Are you a Britpop band? I said, no, we're not Britpop. We're Clip Rock. <laughs> you know? 
we're clip pop, we're clip player. And I just came out like that, yeah, yeah. you know, and then I put it on my forehead. I was like, I hate you fucking cunt. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and it just stuck. And we were like, you guys are so desperate to have a scene and to market something. Even when someone just says something out of their ass, you're going to make it into a scene. And so the next minute, there are all these bands calling clip pop, clip pop bands. So they're just trying to, and we were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. And then we made it back and I said, clip pop is dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But so we were the only band in it. It was just can, us. Can, can I just, uh, let's just clarify that. Are yeah. you or are you not still a clip rock band? Well, no, the clip rock is, there's only us. Right, okay, just checking. <laughs> but so you us. still are? Well, no, okay, because not. we ended the scene. Oh, you ended it? Uh, yeah, okay. stay with me. Thank God stay for, with thank me. God for that. I'm so confused. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Stay with me, mate. Um, yeah, no, we, it, it was just literally a joke. There's a clip rock festival, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm dying to go. Yeah, there is. How can there you be know? a clip rock festival really, without you? Well, I'm pleased about it because they just took something and they just, that's classic Skunk and Nancy. They took something and then it's a whole other thing by themselves. <laughs> and I love it and I've missed it every time, but I really support it and I'm really happy about it. And it's just basically girl rock and girl bands, right, 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 which right, is right. freaking great. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, yeah, and I've, yeah. I'm dying to get down with them one yeah. day. It's going to happen. Let, let's move on quickly to, to your first couple of singles. We're not going to do the whole of the band's history. We don't have the time. But we will touch on some salient points. Because your first single was uh, Little Baby Swastika. Yes. Second single was Selling Jesus. Both fairly political tunes, really. Yeah. Was that a deliberate statement or two statements based on you wanting to say, we actually have something to say? Or was it well, just um, something that happened? Little Baby Swastika was an accident. Uh, Selling Jesus was the first proper single. Yeah, and yeah. we definitely want to come out like firing all cylinders. You know, one of our influ band that influenced us was Rage Against the Machine, yeah, you know, and we just love that. And But we, you know, Little Baby Swastika was actually a Radio 1 single, so it was yeah, never yeah. actually released. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it just just became in demand. They just did some competition, and we won it, and so they printed the single, which was the competition, and it became a thing. And that was the kind of beginning of Skunk and Nancy, but that was out way before we released the album. Yeah, Selling Jesus, it was... Do you know, it was just, that was us, you know, and that song really summed up the whole of Skunk and Nancy at that moment in time. You know, um, there was a, like now, uh, and now's worse actually, but like then there was just a lot of stuff to talk about. I mean, I was raised in Brixton um, and we went through two riots, 1981 and 82. Every time people wanted to riot, they came to Brixton, you know, <laughs> and um, it's like not that much fun here. It's not a riot of a time. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it's like, and so it was just, we, Brixton, when we were growing up, was just no money, no funding, nothing, like a lot of inner city places, like Peckham, like Camberwell, like King's Cross, no money going into those areas. And so you just got all the shit all the time from the government and the underfunding. And so we just had a lot to be unhappy and very angry about. And that just was reflected on, in our music. You know, none of us are from wealthy backgrounds, we're all working class kids. Um, you know, angry young kids, and that's 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 what really really drove us. Is like we know th we have to say something about this, and this has to be reflected in our music because it's part of us. Yeah, but there's a real duality in the way in which you write lyrics. There's there's the angry side as well, and then there's the really well yeah. personal and 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 kind of more tender side. Um, yeah, I is that a reflection of just your own personality? Yeah, like it's duality? like our songs are like the mellow songs are like cutthroat love. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you just get a razor blade or, uh, and you know, just write a song about uh, how I feel. I mean, there's a juxtaposition because some of the melodies can be really lovely and soft and light and beautiful, but the lyrics are just like, I'll stab you and I'll kill you. you know? I shouldn't say stab in this environment no, right now. No, you can't talk but, about um, stabbing so in no, yeah, Don't do it, kids. No. Um, but it's just, it was, that's, it was that angst in that kind of, um, you know, that for me, I just felt there's enough lovely love songs, you know, that is just not influential on our music at all. There's not, I think we've had one in the whole history of Skunk and Nancy because that's just not really normal, you know. It's the, the normal life is actually a lot more glutteral, a lot more um, painful, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, love yeah. and love, life and love and politics, you know, it's a painful existence being a human on this planet. Um, and so it doesn't really move me to write happy songs. If you want happy songs, go listen to EDM or something. You know, it's, there's lots of people doing that. 
Um, and that just wasn't in our nature. But there is, as you say, duality, because um, the most famous songs really are the, the ballads. You well, know, they the kind of songs. are, which people then perceive yeah. as being love songs, oddly enough, because they don't listen to the lyrics. Just because you feel good, no yeah. just nothing, you know, well, I forgot the lyric. You've forgotten the lyrics, yeah. It's all right, it? just sing the lyrics to Blind, we'll be all right. Doesn't make it right, thank yeah. you, thank you. You win a prize. <laughs> I mean, it's such a small song in your catalogue. Well, <laughs> exactly. It? No one knows no, I that mean, one. I mean, I think our songs are quite wordy. There's a lot... Um, yeah, I mean, people still don't know what hedonism actually is. Yeah, no, why? <laughs> 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 um, you know, that song was written four o'clock in the morning when I got dumped so badly. And it was the first... Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do not sympathise for me. Um, I, and it was just that, like, you know that first love and then you get that first big absolute dumping from heaven to the ground slam and you feel like absolutely this is nothing you're not going to survive it and i wrote that song four o'clock in the morning like <laughs> i hope you're feeling happy now you know um and then took it to len aaron who we're writing songs at the time yeah, and yeah. and he was like it needs a chorus i was like i hope you're feeling happy now is a chorus and it's like no it needs a chorus what's the song about and it's like well just because you feel good doesn't make you right and he was like, there's your chorus. I was like, it's a bit wordy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, he was like, put, no, put a melody to it. And I was like, okay. Da, 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 da. And then it just, it, the song was done in five minutes. Right, right, right. Um, but a lot of our songs are like that. You know, who put little baby swastika on the wall? Yeah, yeah. Best song ever. Oh. There you go. Well, thank you very you much. So for those who can't hear on the live um, stream, that's uh, somebody said that's the best song ever. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But it was, I'll tell you the story behind it. We were actually rehearsing this place that was run by this National Front guy. And we'd nice. walk in. I know. He must have been pleased to see you. We, <laughs> that's desperation for you. It was five pound an hour. So <laughs> we were like, yeah, all right, mate, we'll go rehearse. And it was basically some old office block places. And there was just this outside somewhere, there was like a little swastika, it's like this high off the floor. And it just looked like it had been done by a child. It wasn't quite <laughs> right. And I was like, who put little baby swastika on the wall? And then that just kept going out. That, oh, it wasn't very high. It couldn't be more than four years old. It just rhymed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then it's just a really, it just, I, you put a bit of melody to it, it becomes hooky. And I think sometimes when things are difficult and you have to learn them, they stick in your head more. And that was the theory behind calling Bands Kankanansi. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger. When we were kids, right, right, Schwarzenegger, that it just wasn't a typical name, but everybody knew it because they heard it a lot, and it was a Schwarzenegger effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just thought if you keep like saying who put, you know, skunk and who put it, then it becomes hooky because people have to learn it to remember it. It's like rap, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, you yeah. learn the words, and there's loads of them. But if you <laughs> like something, you learn it, and then it becomes, it stays with you forever. Let, yeah. me, let, me, let me ask you a question relating to words and how you write and, and the things that drive you to write as well, though, in a sort of tangential way. H yeah. How important are, are the subjects of race and sexuality to you in terms of your lyrics? Are they irrelevant? I or mean, you are know, they it's just... Core? I mean, the next, I guess the next kind of um, wave of, of politics and how you talk about things is intersectionality, where it's, you don't separate things, they're just all the same yeah and that's kind of like if you imagine it's got a big pot and it's just all in there and it all churns around and it doesn't get separated it's just all together but i think that um just being who i am i just had to have a lot of crap thrown at me you know from various things for various reasons for being black for being gay for being female whatever you know for wearing for matching my car today um yeah sorry for those who don't understand that Actually, go outside and you'll see Skin's mm -hmm. car. It's white and black. Yeah. She's come dressed as her car. I've come Amazing. dressed. It's really highly embarrassing for Rockstar. I hadn't but noticed um, until you pointed it out, and now everyone knows. I thought it was the first thing you'd see. I, I was. I didn't want to say. <laughs> it's a hairdresser's car, and she came dressed as a hairdresser. <laughs> but um, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, it just... Um, I think that... The, the, it's kind of when you're writing songs, the most important thing is have something to say. You know, what do you have to say? The difference between me writing songs and you writing songs is you're you and I'm me. And it's how you express your own individual self 
is the difference, you know? And then it, obviously the difference is the quality, the levels of quality. Do you do it well? Are you shit? Are you great? Does it, you know? But nobody can express the things that you, the way that you do it is the way you do it. Um, and, but for me, it's just important. The song has to have something to say. What do you want to say? Why are you writing songs? Why are you here? What's the point of it all? Um, and so that's where I always start. I always start with, like, for instance, I was, um, uh, my mother's never going to see this, hopefully. So <laughs> I was um, with my mum the other day, and she was being miserable about something. You know, she can be a bit miserable. And um, she's great, though. You know, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and uh, she was, and I was looking at her, and I noticed, like, and I said, oh, my mum, you know, and I just looked at her and I thought, my mother has no laughter lines. And I thought, that's a great idea for a song, my mother has no laughter lines, because she's always unhappy, she's always being miserable. I could have just written a song about my mother's really unhappy, but who wants to buy that? Who wants to get into that? And I think that's the difference. It's like, I look at her and I see my mother's unhappy, my mother has no laughter lines, because she, it's just smooth, because she hasn't smiled enough in her life, you know? <laughs> You've got a heckler in the audience here, see. They can't hear you off camera. Apparently, the, the so because, she, because she's saying black don't crack, basically, <laughs> and beige don't age is the way the, the one I added. But no, my mother is, um, you know, she's she doesn't have many lines anyway, but she has got some here. She got <laughs> she got those ones, but she hasn't got those ones. So, um, and I just then that's an example of interpretation. Is like yeah, yeah. when you look, what do you see? Do you see an unhappy person? But why is, what is, how are you going to describe that? How are you going to translate that to another person? And so that's the interesting thing, is that translation is the, 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 the quality. Yeah. And how you describe it. Is, is, and and that's, that's the root of songwriting, really. Have you, have you written a, that lyric then? My mother has no la laughter lines. Is that in a song? No, I just thought of it. Right, okay. Because you yeah, were worried that she might see this, you know. Don't and, and steal it, don't steal it. No, I'm just you thinking know, if I you've written that in a song, she's going to hear that. And ultimately, you know, she's not going to be very happy, is she? So she'll have no laughter lines again. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're don't, right. Maybe don't put that one out. Well, but I might change it to Martha has no laughter lines. Oh, good effort. That could, that could be anybody. <laughs> yeah, Mother <laughs> Martha. <laughs> let's, let's move on very quickly and talk about, about, <laughs> the, about, about, about some of the band's kind of uh, salient points, really. And, and especially that very, that, that the first two albums, really, Paranoid and Sunburn. And Stooge, massive, massive records, you know, platinum records in this country. Really, really huge records around the world as well. Um, Triple platinum. Eh? Triple platinum. Triple platinum. Oh, all right, sorry. I didn't mean, didn't mean to downplay them. <laughs> Pretty but fucking those big. Those were the days when you could be... Imagine you could tr trying to be triple platinum now. You know, they have to sell about five records. I <laughs> know, <laughs> oh, I think it's the same amount. It just means that, you know, yeah. no one sells that amount anymore. No. But, but, but coming back to those records and, and, and to the impact on the band at that time, how did success actually impact the band? Because you're a very self-contained unit. You're very close. Um, but obviously, you know, suddenly, you in particular, you know, it's not like you could just walk down the street. You're very recognisable as well. Do you know... To be really honest, it was years behind us. It took us years to realise that we were successful and famous. Because in those days, there was no social media. And you just, you'd go to a town, you'd do a great gig, and when you'd leave and go to the next town, and meanwhile, in that other town that you just left, everyone's going mad, everyone's going crazy. But you don't see any of it because you left. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. You're in the next town where everyone's like, impress me. So... It wasn't, and then we were on tour nine months of the year. Yeah, yeah. And we go a go to a country, fire that country up, and then we'd be in the next country when that country's gone mad about Skunk and It was literally always behind us. And so it didn't really affect us. You know, I remember the point when we realised that we were doing well, and I think it was 1998 or 99, and... Our manager said, our manager Lee, we have the same manager for the whole career, still now. And our, our manager said, we said, well, she said, well, what do you want to do? Where do you want to record the record? And we were like, I don't know, where can we do it? It's going to be expensive. And she goes, you can record wherever you want. <laughs> and we went, really? <laughs> She's like, yeah, you can record wherever you want. You can go to Jamaica and record. We're like, really? <laughs> and then we were like, Oh, because up until then, 
you just got that struggling working class mentality and you think that you have no money, you have nothing and you've just got to keep working hard because you think that it's all about to go and it's all about... My mum still has that now, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I know older people, are, our grandmas and our, you know, they have that now. They still think they're in the war. And um, that's what we were like. And it wasn't literally until our album was coming out and we were going to headline Glastonbury. Yeah, and yeah. we were like, we must be big. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we must be doing yeah. all right. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. because with PRS at the time, which is um, the money you get when you sell a record, it would take three or four years to, to come to you. Yeah, so yeah. you may be selling loads of CDs or vinyl or whatever. You know, that's how long ago it was. But you don't, you're not getting any money. You're still poor. You can still barely pay for anything. And it, it must have got there in 98. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the checks came in in 98 after working in the band since 94. And then we were like, oh, okay. Um, but, you know, different countries are different vibes. So in England, you know, I think if you're a pop band, people screaming girls are going to run up to you and go, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but they're not going to do that to a rock band because they, they want to look cool. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if yeah. you're a boy band and you're a girl band or, you know, you, people are like, ah. with rock bands, they don't do that. They're like, all right, Skunk Nancy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, would you sign this for me? Quick selfie, yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah, love your music, yeah. <laughs> Except when we go to Italy, they just don't care. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Italians, well, you know, Sorry, but Italians, like, they just don't care. They but, you're, but you're massive in Italy. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. There, there's no being cool there. No, no, but, but no. you know. You they will knock on your door at two, 2 o'clock in the morning. Can you sign this, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But actually, you're, you're it's true. But I have it's, I'm telling you, it's happened. She's looking at me like. No skunk army. No skunk no, army. Not the skunk of army, but, but the common or garden. That well, was that, before that, X Factor. That, that, no, that, but that, that's a very good point, actually. She's like, she's like, it's, it's your own, she, you, people go here. She's like, we're, we're, uh, we're very famous this year. And then I was an X Factor judge. So I she's know, like, yeah. that's the thing that made it extra. And you're right, but it was already bad. Don't try <laughs> and get away with it, man. <laughs> you, I mean, to be an X Factor, you're the only X Factor judge that's ever sat on this, on this couch, it has to be said. Oh. So, you know, oh. but uh, that's a first. And, and, I, I did and, it and in one Italy. would hope the last as well, but we shall see. <laughs> um, but but, but, but when, it, when, it, when it comes down to when it comes down to more sensible things, as you say, 1999, you are officially a huge band. Actually, where did you choose to go and record? I've forgotten. Did, you didn't go to Jamaica to record, did you? No, Bearsville. 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 Not that expensive. Not that impressive either. Upstate you, New. Upstate up, New York. Are you kidding? That's New where York. Jimi Hendrix recorded. I mean, Bearsville. I know, but if you're being exotic. It's legendary. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. You're being exotic. You know, no, we you've got to choose the music. We went over. to Bahamas. Okay. Yeah, you're not going we to make a good. Whatever. Who has made a good record in the Bahamas? Uh, well, there was uh, Bahamas. Grace, Grace Jones. Yeah, it was different. No, she's from Jamaica. It's like, you know. What? It's the same. It's all she's raised, born and raised in a hot country, you know, Caribbean country. It's so the that's same. Right. She's like, it's the same vibe. Whatever. For her, anyway. the shock is if she went <laughs> when she goes to has to record in like you know, the northern Germany. That's the shock for her, you know. But Rick Bahamas is probably, like to be just, fair, she you know, has recorded kick in a Germany. football and it will land in Bahamas from Jamaica. <laughs> but um, no, we actually went to we want to record with Andy Wallace. Right, of course, yeah. yeah. So we went to Burrsville, which is a legendary. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was a legendary, legendary recording studio. Yeah, yeah. You got to choose the music above the bikini. No, agreed, agreed. Uh, but 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 bef I'll tell you what. Before before we lose our shape completely, though, um, <laughs> let me. I mean, obviously, you also toured with some unbelievable people. You toured with David Bowie. You obviously toured with you too, and you were obviously very close with Lemmy as well. Yes. Uh, of those kind of people, out of say David or Bono or Lemmy, who gave you the best advice? Gosh. I'm going to have to rush it. Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, I'm just thinking about all the, the bits of advice, actually. You know, I mean, you two were pretty fun because they, we talked with them in a very, very early days when we were a brand new band, and they taught us a lot of class. Like, we came off stage and they had a bottle of, bottle of champagne, glasses, personally signed things saying thank you on, to come on the tour. And we stole that from them and we 
do that to every band that comes on tour with us. And then after the gig, they invited us to their dressing room, hanging out with them, and they were just really down to earth, fun, normal people. And that was really, really classy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then Lemby is just a class in himself, you know, because... Well, he's a, yeah, a law yeah. unto himself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he, in, he introduced me to JD. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, he was just like, God, I mean, Ace probably want more stories about Lemmy, but, um, yeah, he would just kind of like, just, he's just all about keeping it real, you know? Yeah, and also, he really, he was one of the few people that would say Skunk and Nancy was his favourite band, you know, and he didn't care what anybody thought about it, or if it's cool or not, he's like, yeah, you're my best band, you're my favourite band, you know? Um, I mean, my, I think if you say the saddest thing was I never got to finish that track with him that he was doing on this solo album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, t t tell us a bit about that, because, you know, t tell us about that song, because... Well, we, we kept meeting up and drinking. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I never actually got into the studio. Um, and this went on for, like, four, three, four years. And, um, gosh, you just reminded me of something really made me sad. But, um, and he would just like, oh, we'd meet up in L.A., whatever. And then we would just end up drinking all night and not actually doing any work. And so finally I said to him, look, we've got to record this track. I'm going to book some studio time. We're going to do it and blah, blah, blah. And by that time he was like, too ill. And he said, yeah, no, I'm a bit not so well. I'm like, but I'm going to get back to you and blah, blah, blah. But the nicest thing that Lemmy did, and I don't know if I've told anyone, was um, I was in a very serious thing, and he got back to me the same day I'd broken up from being married, and uh, and he was just kind of, and I just texted him, said, I can't, you know, I can't talk about this right now, I just, you know, today has been whatever. And he just sent me the loveliest text back, and I still have it, and it was just like, whenever you're here, I'm here for you. I'm a list open heart and I'm an open ear. All you've got to do is call me or text me. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I that's actually the last text I had from him. Yeah. So, and it was just that thing that he has this, re he had this reputation of being, and it's all true, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's, but his reputation was earned, it's all true. But the other side that people don't know is like, what a softie he was. He was oh, such absolutely. He was. a lovely, lovely, lovely man yeah, and a yeah, big yeah. heart and big softy. Yeah, yeah. And he liked all the really lovely, quiet ballad songs of Skunk and Nancy the most, you know? So that's what we were going to record, like an acoustic, delicate song. Right, right, right. Did it have a name? Mm, no, we never got there. Right, right, right. I'm yeah. I got pissed with you again would probably be the <laughs> <laughs> closest title, the more accurate title yeah. that we again, could have yeah. had. Pissed again, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No absolutely. work, but pissed again. Well, no, I mean, it, yeah, he was a, a gentleman, of course, and, yeah. and always. I mean, you know, uh, we're, we're talking around uh, Kerrang Awards week, and every time he came to the Kerrang Awards, he was, uh, yeah, an unbelievable gentleman. Apart from the time I think he turned up with a ginormous sword. <laughs> but um, we'll draw a diplomatic veil over that one. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the memorabilia he was collecting. I was a bit worried. Though. I know. You put it in the yeah, cloakroom, yeah. to be fair, after I remonstrated. But that was fine. <laughs> but talking, talking uh, about the Kerrang Awards, actually, um, obviously they're, they're, they're happening this week and, and you're coming along. But um, uh, there have been certain things that have happened at the Kerrang Awards as far as Skunk and Nancy are concerned. Uh, yes. you, you met Mark Richardson there first and foremost. And yeah, that was probably the most important thing that happened. Mm. We, did, we, you know, we just had a bunch of recast drummers. The first drummer, I should say, Robbie France, was an incredible drummer, yeah. but uh, very sadly um, yeah, an fine. alcoholic, and, and that, that got the better of him in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, but after that, we just had like lame drum after lame drummer. You know, yeah, after yeah. Robbie France, it was difficult to find. And then I was in the Karanga Wars, and I saw this tall, beautiful, blonde guy. <laughs> And he comes walking over to me, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, I'm in here. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, he, and then he goes, your drum is shit. I should be in your band. And I was like, you're so right. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even heard him play it. I just knew that attitude is exactly what we needed in Skunk and Nancy. Just like, like I'm going to tell you exactly how it is, and I'm going to walk in, I'm going to smash a drum kit to shreds, and which is what he did. Yeah, and the yeah. first thing we did was like... Um, I think Strange Days. Right, we right, did right. the soundtrack thing for Strange Days. Yeah, yeah. And he, I was just like, this is great. You know, he's the loudest drummer ever. And so that was important. Um, and the rest of the times, you know, it's like I remember Marilyn Manson sticking an award up my bum. 
Yeah, there was that. Yeah, yeah. that was that was good. That um, was that was. <laughs> and then of course there was uh, bizarrely enough a punch up between uh, some of your lads and the lads in Ash as well, which went down into uh, well folklore really is. Uh, I, w- I wasn't there. No, I know you weren't. Otherwise, you would have probably punched them harder. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, yeah, it was funny. Well, I, uh, yeah, I'm I didn't say who came off worse. Yeah, I just remembered that we, you know, that picture that we have uh, on the front cover. They smelled really bad. <laughs> they did. They smelled, you know, lovely band, lovely boys to me. I don't know about the punch yeah. up. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like I will say to the boys, well, it was nice to me. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, yeah, they just they they hadn't watched for days typical no. touring touring thing well, you that's know. how everyone was in those days yeah nobody Soap washed. wasn't invented nobody washed no. but um, coming back to where you are now i mean as i said 25 years of skunk uh, the live album 25 of 25 is out right yes. now what is next for you guys though when are we actually going to hear some new music um w- i heard a master today oh and i think that's all i'm allowed to say I That's all you're allowed to say. Oh, Why are you looking over there? Is I heard I o- we okayed the final master of something. Yeah. What's it today? called? Today, and I what's can't it, tell what, you what it's it called? called. Can I? My press guy's over there in the he corner. He doesn't, I'm not allowed he doesn't to. Even know. I'm not allowed to talk anymore about it. Look at that little jerk. He doesn't even know what oh, he's talking about. And that's all I'm going to say. It, it got finished today. We we had we heard the final mastering this morning. So there will be new Skunk and Nancy music very very soon. You sooner than you can absolutely believe. Well, like tomorrow. It's not tomorrow, but I'm not saying I'm not saying anything else. Yeah, you I'm see gonna, what you're doing? You know it's just I'm trying to get in there, trying you to get his information. I'm going to fry this out of you. I'm going to come back to this question, and eventually you're going to say <laughs> the track is called this. So it's about I'll te- this. I'll tell you after. Yeah, no. So, but obviously, there's 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 also a bunch of live shows uh, coming, yes. which which are going to be. I forgot there was a dog there. Yeah, so did so did I. I just nearly sat on him actually. But um, but but so so there's uh, so there's live shows coming as well, and I yes. believe it's. Uh, well, it looks like quite a spectacular show. Are you allowed to talk about that? Or, or, um, yeah, or do you have I mean, to no, no, no. I, I don't. I can, talk, can I talk? I, c- oh, I could talk God. about the live shows. You could talk about the live shows. Excellent. It's what happens when you control your life. You have to, <laughs> to ask someone what you can say. Um, no, the live, you know, we, we kind of, the live shows got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the last tour we did was probably the biggest tour we've done visually. We had seven screens on stage. We hit all the amps. We had all this stuff going on screens. And then it basically everyone stole our idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we've gone in the complete opposite thing. We've kind of gone a bit back to basics. Is that a Tory, th- Tory anthem? It's, uh, no, I'm not sure, actually. We'll draw a diplomatic veil over that, shall we? Sorry. We've gone back to basics. I'm saying it again because I love being booed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring it on. Um, and um, it's basically, there's loads of amps on stage. There's, um, you know, it's a bit of a best off because it's 25 years. Um, but there's already a couple of new songs in there. Right, okay. Including the new song. Can't, yeah. Including the new song you've just finished that's yeah, called. Yeah, that's called Mind Your Own Business. Oh, that one. If it isn't called that, I shall be very, very upset. <laughs> Someone's done that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, um, we got a couple of, because we, I, I can't, you know, we can't be one of them nostalgic bands that just, just do old stuff. So we've got some new stuff going on. But it's actually going to be, um, my outfits are pretty crazy. Uh, the craziest ever. There's a lot of them because of you freaking gets on Instagram. So there's like a lot, m- a lot more changes than there was before. Um, and it's like a visceral rock show. Right, you know, right, it's right, going right. to be a real loads of amp on stage, really loud, really in your face, and just a band on stage performing. Right, right. N- right. A couple of tricks, but not too many. Well, we look forward to that, it has to be said. Me we too. Do, we do look forward to that. Um, after that, then, I guess there'll be an album and there'll be more touring, I, I presume. Um, I, we haven't planned that far. Crikey, get on with it. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. <laughs> I know you do. I just want to know the name of that song. It's only one song, for God's sake. It's not exactly... <laughs> it's not a state secret. It's not called Mind Your Own Business. I know it's not called Mind Your Own Business. Okay, good. No, no, I'm not even giving you that. No, you're not even giving me that. Give me nothing. Give me nothing. Anyway, how's the dog doing? Moving on. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just have to wrap She's it up. She's snuggling up to you. Hey? She, he snug, she snuggles up to you. Well, you know, he loves me. What can she. I say? Mm. She. 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 Oh, there mm. you go. Anyway, let's um, move on. Let me let me ask you a, 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 a final question, really, because looking back at 25 years, well, maybe a couple of final questions. What's been the most remarkable thing that's happened to you 
in the last 25 years as Skunk and Nancy? I mean, um, there's two answers to that. One is getting to 25 years, especially in the current um, dirge of music that we're currently sitting in, um, to actually be still doing sold-out tours and to do things like this and have all these lovely people just come and still support you. I mean, I think that, um, you know, Kerrang, you know, it's like, number one, being there from day one and still there for us. And, and I think that for us is... That's really the definition of success, you know, because we always saw this as a lifetime career, you know, like Rolling Stones style. So um, I think that's really the fact that it's we're able to do it and I still feel fit and healthy and I feel happy and we're, we really have a scream on tour. We love each other and we have a laugh. And, and just having every day just be a fun thing is, is a major thing for us. But if I look back on, like, poignant moments... Um, there's a few. I think um, singing for Nelson Mandela was quite a biggie. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah. You know, I mean, it would have been. That was quite a good one. Um, with 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 the Stevie Wonder on keyboards. Natch. Standing next to that pedo Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah, to be I fair, there were, there were a few other people there as well, weren't there? I mean, you know. Listen, he was a pedo, and let's all not freaking be in denial about it. And I'm not gonna like sit on the fence and be all Michael Jackson friendly. I'm not. Not at all. Um, and, uh, you know, so... <sighs> now I've got that in my system. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anybody um, else you want to have a go at? <laughs> <laughs> Loads. <laughs> wait, wait. Stick so with <laughs> Hold on, some publicity stick, stick advice. The Strictly one. the dead ones, apparently. <laughs> okay. He, th he thinks I'm going to know Gallagher, everybody. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, I think that's really a major thing, you know. Like, we um, we still really have a laugh, and I think that's really... It's really fun being in Skunk and Nancy. Yeah. Um, and it's really enjoyable, and I think after 25 years, that's, like, a major thing. Um, headlining Glastonbury was pretty awesome. Yeah, of course. That was that a was pretty awesome moment. Um, yeah, gosh, there's a few, but those ones jump out. My final question to you is, I suppose, what has the last 25 years taught you as a person? Um, I've learned a lot, I would have to say. Um, I think that I'm very... Um, I used to be very nervous and very scared of everything and very kind of, like, conscious of everything and worry about too much. And I think it's just actually taught me to relax. And I actually now are in this point in my life where I like a challenge. I like something difficult and something that's like out of the ordinary and something that's that's going to be a bit more hard work. That's because for me, it's much more fun working things out than when we were when we were a first band. You know, we used to get to the top of the mountain, and be so looking at the next top of the mountain that we forgot to enjoy the climb. Um, and so there was so much good stuff that happened that we missed out on because we was just we just didn't even see it because we we're just so you know, looking at that next major thing that we got to get to that we don't know how to get to. Um, and so now I'm just like, I'm just chilled now. I'm not so <laughs> nervous about everything. I'm very much relaxed. And I realise that challenges are just there. They're just, they've actually made me a better person and they've made me um, appreciate lots of different things um, so much more. And... Um, so I think that that's a good part of my character. Is I I don't I quite like it when things are a little difficult. It's f it feels like fun to me when yeah, things. Yeah. Are, I shouldn't say this probably. <laughs> now I'm going to have the worst twenty next twenty years of my life. But <laughs> things are um, things are a bit more fun when you've got issues to work out and there's problems. That's more fun than having everything easy and having an easy life and whinging and moaning about how this and this is all this is so difficult. You know we are living in the snowflake generation, aren't we? Well, we kind of are. Whinging, social media whingers, moan, moaners. Um, and, but I think sometimes when things are dif difficult, that's when you really, kind of your character comes out and you get, get over it. And I think we're just living in a generation where it's very difficult to be yourself and be honest and discuss things. Because on that way, in that discussion on the way there, you might say something that is just going to tarnish you forever. And, uh, and I think now it's 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 quite difficult to be yourself in this society. It's difficult to be real and be and just be who you want to be. 
So um, I don't know why I, why I wandered back. Where was, where was I going with that one? I'm not sure, but truthfully, yeah. I mean, but I it's think... I mean, I, I, guess, I guess, you know, it's, 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 it's just much... Life is much more fun now because I, I enjoy the moment and the things that are happening now. Like, I like doing this. This is really fun. This is not press. This is not anything else. This is like, I'm talking to you. It's, you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Yeah, easy. well, we could be having this conversation down yeah, the Yeah, exactly. And, do, and so. it's... Yeah, we might do, yeah. yeah. And it, it's just like, everything is just, I really enjoy all of it now. You know, nothing is stressful, nothing is work. And, and it's just, everything's just more relaxed and it, you don't have to stress so much about things. That's, the, uh, that's what comes with age and experience. Yeah, age and experience and actually realising if there is a problem, solve it. Yeah, yeah. You know, don't give it to someone else and don't, don't blame somebody else. It's their fault why I've got this problem. Somebody asked me the other day, what is it like? It, you know, the question was, when, you're, um, when you started out, you must have had a lot of sexism and homophobia and racism, and it must have been really, really awful for you. You must have had to deal with so much. And I was like, yeah, it was awful. And I was like, well, how did you deal with it? And I was like, it's not my problem. And I yeah. think that's the way to live life. It's like, those things are big, heavy weight and boulders that you can carry on your shoulders. And if that happens, then they've won and you've lost because you've got all the weight and they're like walking around floating on air because they've destroyed you and given you all of their issues. And for me, it's just like that. When I got to that and I realized that, it's just not my problem. I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy being me. You know, you don't want me to be me. That's your problem. It's your issue. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's probably the one nugget of thing that, that if I'm a bit of advice I can give anyone, you know. Well, that's a great bit of advice, actually. What a, what a bombshell of positivity <laughs> that is. Skin, yeah. thank you so much. And, and My pleasure. And thank you. real pleasure to have you here. Thank you very thank much. You. And thanks to you. No, thanks to Kerrang. Thank for you. being there, all those bastards were getting us down. Thank you, Karang, for all supporting us. I really appreciate it. It's been our pleasure, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Skip. Thank you. Thank you all.